Thanks to everyone for joining us. It is just seven o'clock. I'm going to give one or two more moments for more people to enter from the waiting room. I wanna thank you all so much for joining us tonight. As you are coming in, I do wanna let everyone know that this pro tonight's program is being recorded and will be available for everyone to view later on ACMI. I wanna thank ACMI so much for partnering with us tonight. So it'll be wonderful to access that. If you do need to leave early, just know that that program will be available there. Um, and it's a minute after seven, so I think I'm gonna begin. I'm gonna welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight as we begin a new focus at the library, learning more about the civic organizations around us. We are beginning this series with Pushing the Envelope, a history of the United States Post Office. Why the post office, you might ask? The post office, an organization that has been in the news quite a bit recently, is an organization that we touch every day and likely don't understand very well at all. We are lucky to be joined tonight by Henry Lucas of the Spelman Museum of Stamps and Postal History. Henry Lucas became education director of the Spelman, Spelman Museum in December of 2004. He was a high school social studies teacher in Cambridge and principal of Marblehead, Manchester by the Sea, and Canton High Schools for 35 years previous. After retirement, he served as a docent at the Museum of Fine Arts, the Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Site, and the Harvard Peabody Museum of Natural History. He also gave historic tours of Boston to out of town visitors. In addition, he has served for many years as president of Boston Children's Theater and was the director of the Massachusetts Academic Decathlon for 25 years. I want to give a special thanks tonight for tonight's program for, to uh, the Arlington Libraries Foundation who have been generous enough to fund tonight's program. Thank you so much to the Arlington Libraries Foundation. I hope some of you um, are contributors to that event. And with that, I'd like to turn over the presentation to Henry Lucas. Henry, thank you so much for joining us. And I know that if we were together in the community room at the Robbins Library tonight, you would be receiving a round of applause for joining us. Henry, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Anna. I appreciate that. I appreciate the invitation to uh, talk about the uh, post office. Let me see if I can get my slides up here. Um, all right, I'm gonna go through uh, a bunch of slides. Uh, that hopefully will entertain you, but also give you some uh, uh, history information. We, we like to do stamps because stamps really do uh, tell a historical story. Uh, so tonight's uh, program is uh, kind of taking you right from the uh, first uh, sending of mail in the American colonies up until the present day. And as you know, the post office has certainly been in a lot of uh, uh, controversy. So. Uh, but we do want to thank all our postal workers. I, I know some of you out there probably know your uh, mail carrier. We don't call them uh, mailmen anymore. We call them mail carriers. And they are essential workers. And they have been through uh, quite a bit. So if you haven't had a chance to thank your uh, mail carrier, you really should do that. And of course, the reason everything's in the news is because of the uh, need to have much more uh, voting uh, by mail. Um, have much heavier volume. You've probably been listening to the news. Uh, I've been to a number of post offices and I asked the, uh, the clerks if everything is going fine and they seem to think uh, they're gonna deliver those ballots. So uh, looking, that there's not gonna be the big turmoil that some people have pr predicted. Uh, but the post offices, even without the election going on, is in trouble financially, which is not unusual for the post office. As we'll see right through the years, money in the post office has always been uh, an issue. But let me tell you quickly about our museum. We're out at Regis College. And it's called the Cardinal Spellman uh, Museum of Stamps and uh, Postal History. Uh, there you can see the Cardinal, who was a big stamp collector himself. He was even named Stamp Collector of the Year back in the 50s. And in 1960, he uh, and a bunch of his uh, supporters founded the museum. And on his birthday in uh, 1963, the museum opened. Some of you may remember Cardinal Spellman or have heard about him. He was quite an influential uh, uh, cardinal in, uh, in the United States. And uh, right after World War II, he did uh, become a cardinal. But he uh, gave his collection to the Sisters of St. Joseph, which was the teaching order at Regis. And that's why the museum wound up at uh, Regis. He uh, got the stamp collecting uh, habit, or the fun of it, uh, when he went to study to be a priest in Rome, uh, picked up the habit with friends, 
and ever since then he uh, uh, just kept collecting. He was the vicar of all the Catholic uh, chaplains in the army during World War II, and that was another way to do it. So as I said, the museum opened in uh, 1963 on May 4th, which just happened to be uh, the Cardinal's birthday. So that was a very nice birthday present for him. And uh, he was, as I said, he was well known, not just uh, in the United States, but around the world. This was a stamp issued for him when he visited Nicaragua in 1959. All right, let's get to the uh, program. I've got a lot to do here and uh, uh, let's see what we have. Uh, just a couple of little cartoons. We've been joking a little bit about the post office. As you can see, uh, you're all familiar with forever stamps. Buy them today and you can use them 10, 15 years from now, even though the postage rate will probably go up. Uh, but uh, the post office, as I said, is uh, financially hurting and uh, we hope that the money will come through uh, to support what they need to do. Uh, Congress is uh, waiting. Is Congress actually, my understanding is, has approved the money. It just needs the approval of the, uh, the president. But the unofficial model, uh, model of the uh, museum, I'm, not, I'm sorry, of the post office, neither snow nor rain nor heat, uh, but budget cuts might just uh, affect that. People wonder about that ex expression. It's a phrase that comes from uh, a book written about the Persian Wars by Herodotus, who was a Greek historian, who you can see appears on the uh, stamp. And it was during the wars between the Greeks and the Persians, and uh, the man who delivered the, uh, the message about that. It's not the official motto of the uh, post office, but it is uh, something that everybody associates with it. In fact, uh, if any of you are from New York or uh, suddenly visited one of the huge uh, post offices in uh, New York City is the James Farley building, built in 1912. Interestingly, the same architects that built the uh, uh, Boston Public Library. And uh, uh, if you look closely at the top, you can't see it in this picture, but the official motto is inscribed at the top of the uh, Farley building. James Farley, by the way, was the uh, postmaster general under Franklin Roosevelt. And in those days, uh, your campaign manager very often became the postmaster. And James Farley was actually uh, the, the campaign manager for FDR. Since we're in Arlington, I, uh, uh, there's a, you may, if you've been to the uh, post office, the Arlington post office has one of the uh, murals that were very popularly made during the late 30s and uh, early into 40s. They were uh, WPA projects for uh, help out the artists during the depression and they were hired. Uh, and so if you've been to, uh, I didn't get up to the Arlington Library, but you can see it there. I do have a question for uh, people, maybe they can answer at the end. This was a Google picture I found and it said Arlington Library. And I'm wondering if anybody can tell me is that building still there or if they remember it or not. Uh, that artist, by the way, who did the, uh, the mural, uh, very famous artist, there were, there were quite a few artists, well known, but obviously they were needing uh, support, so they got the uh, financial backing to do the mural. And in fact, about a year ago, I think, uh, the post office actually put out a series of stamps with uh, the murals on them. And there are 37 murals that were done in Massachusetts and over a thousand nationwide. And like anything else, if you just Google post office murals, you can find all the ones that are in, uh, in the state. There's a little controversy. We always like controversy. And so uh, about 16 murals have been uh, covered up in the last few months. Uh, but, but because of uh, concerns or protests even from uh, the community that the murals uh, touch on subjects that are um, something they shouldn't be, mostly uh, regarding uh, slavery and uh, Native Americans. So uh, not the case in Arlington. And uh, so, as I said, 16 murals in 12 states have been done there. Since you're also in Arlington, I think everybody up there is proud of uh, Uncle Sam. And the post office has uh, honored Uncle Sam on a uh, number of stamps, including uh, all of these. So. And now, uh, the other thing about post office, uh, it, it's one of the largest, if not the largest, employer uh, in, the, uh, in the government. And quite a few famous people have served in one way or another either in the post office or delivering a, a mail, and they have all appeared on uh, on stamps. In fact, I'm just looking at my slide. I, I left out somebody, and that was Abraham Lincoln, who was a postmaster for a while. Uh, he didn't do so well. He spent all this time reading, and so they 
and asked him and dismissed him from that. But these are some of the stamps that celebrate some of the people who uh, work for the, uh, the post office, as I said, in one way or the other. Okay, let's get to the start of uh, delivering mail. Uh, in 1639, the Crown established what is considered maybe the first post office in the, uh, the colonies, and it was down uh, right in the Quincy Market area, the Fairbanks Tavern. And of course, the Pilgrims, Puritans had only arrived in Boston, uh, let's say, uh, what, nine years earlier. And so uh, they said that as of 1639, all ships bringing in uh, mail uh, would have to deliver, deposit them at the uh, tavern, and then they would be distributed from there, and the tavern owners would make some money in getting the uh, uh, delivery. Then the, uh, down in uh, New York City uh, in 1673, uh, Governor Francis Lovelace established a postal road, road between New York City and, and Boston, which we all still refer to as the Boston Post Road. And the first uh, rider was John Winthrop the Younger, related to John Winthrop of Boston. And uh, he uh, actually left earlier from Hartford. Uh, and unfortunately, when the uh, British uh, regained uh, New York from the uh, Dutch, the uh, King Philip War broke out. And so communications between Boston and uh, New York City were delayed uh, until the uh, agreements between the uh, Native Americans were solved. But this is a map of the Boston Post Road. There actually are considered three post roads, the upper, uh, the middle, and the lower uh, routes. Uh, the one we mostly associate with is the uh, one that goes route 20 out to uh, Springfield and then heads down to uh, uh, New Haven. It would take about two weeks for the uh, riders to uh, deliver mail between there. A couple of uh, good books are available. The King's Best Highway probably gives you the best explanation of what this whole system uh, was like. Uh, and of course, when we talk about the history of the post office, we have to mention Benjamin Franklin. He was made postmaster uh, for both the uh, colonies and Canada in 1753. Uh, and then a few years later, he was made uh, postmaster for all the 13 uh, colonies. And uh, he did many things to improve uh, the uh, delivery of mail. He set up milestones, uh, which some about 20 of them still exist on the uh, Post Road uh, between here and uh, uh, Springfield. And he actually had an odometer that he attached to the back of his carriage. He visited all 13 colonies to set up these post roads. He also was able to get the uh, riders to deliver the mail through the dark. And so it was quite a fast uh, delivery between Philadelphia and uh, New York City. And then he uh, was named when the uh, co first Continental Congress met actually the Second Continental Congress, he was picked as the postmaster uh, for the colonies. He left soon after that to go to uh, France, and so his son took over. And then uh, in 1792, after we became a country, uh, the post office was officially established, and Samuel Osgood was the first uh, postmaster general. Uh, and after the war, most of the mail, actually all the mail between, before the revolution, was carried just on horseback. And after the war, they started delivering uh, coaches. And interestingly, the Concord coach became quite popular. And of course, we know the, uh, the reason one of the controversies in the uh, current situation is the post office is mentioned in the Constitution. Uh, the, uh, const the post office has the right to establish the post offices and post roads. And uh, that's exactly what's happened all over uh, the years. And then, of course, when the Northwest Territory, which included uh, uh, Ohio, Indiana and Illinois, when that opened up, more and more settlers were going, and of course, they, they demanded that they uh, be receiving mail, and so the postal routes uh, grew quite, uh, quite quickly in, uh, in that time period. And most mail, some was then by, delivered by carriages, much of it was done on uh, the river, uh, the steamboat paddles uh, would uh, deliver the mail, and then they would be given to the uh, delivery. Again, people did not, I'll mention this later, but people did not get mail delivered to their house. If you thought you were getting a, a letter, you would go to the local post office and have to pick it up, and uh, we'll find out too. Um, there was a big controversy in the 1830s about abolition literature. Uh, the Southern postmasters were refusing to uh, 
um, deliver some what they considered incendiary uh, uh, literature, and uh, this created a contract between the local states and uh, the federal government, which continued right up until the, uh, the Civil War. Now, uh, people don't realize that uh, before 1840, if you mailed a letter, there was no stamps, there were no stamps, and you had to pay uh, to receive the letter. So that when the mailman, when you went to the post office to see if there was a letter for you, they would say yes, and then they would charge you. And this was not a very good system. So in England, uh, where they had the same system of making the receiver pay, uh, they said, we need a better system. And so they came up with a stamp, a piece of paper with the picture of Queen Victoria on the front uh, and on the back, a little glue, printed them up in sheets. There were no perforations, so they had to use a, a scissor to uh, cut the uh, sheets. Uh, but that was the origin of a postage stamp. The reason I have uh, Henry there, King Henry the the Eighth, uh, England is the only country, by the way, that only, that does not have to put its name of the country on the stamp. You might see the uh, Queen Elizabeth's uh, silhouette there in the upper left-hand corner of the stamp. That indicates it's from Great Britain, but every other country has to. And that's because uh, Great Britain was the first country to have stamps. That was 1840, and it took until uh, 18. Well, the man who invented stamps is usually a man named Roland Hill and he has appeared on a, a number of stamps. But this is what a letter would have looked like before stamps. They would have put, uh, and again, they very rarely used street addresses, and so it was not that much mail that people knew where you, you weren't being delivered to your house anyway. And the price would be put somewhere on there, uh, up in the corner, and that would again have to be paid by the recipient. And then in 1840, uh, Daniel Webster uh, heard about the experiment with stamps in England, and he said that we should be doing the same thing in uh, the United States. And like many things uh, today, it took a little while for Congress to actually get around to authorizing postage stamps. So he suggested it in 1840, but it wasn't until 1847 that we issued our first two postage stamps. We charged a little more than a penny. And by in those days, unlike today, we charged by the distance. So the first 300 miles would cost you five cents, it would cost you a Ben Franklin stamp. And if it was over 300 miles, you'd have to pay 10 cents. And you can see, of course, we picked uh, uh, Washington and uh, Benjamin Franklin as the first two people on a stamp. And then now today, every country has stamps and uh, it creates, well, it's the way we communicate uh, even today. Uh, now, a couple of little things you might be wondering, the first for, forever stamps, as you can see, they came out uh, and that, it was just an experiment and it turns out to be very popular. Uh, the first self-adhesive stamp was back in 1974. It was a Christmas stamp. Uh, unfortunately, the glue was not very good and so they discontinued doing self-adhesive till uh, a little bit later and uh, there. But we all remember, uh, interestingly, we get kids who come to the museum and the first thing we ask them to do is to send themselves a postcard. Well, that poses a couple of problems. One, very often they don't know how to address a postcard or an envelope. And two, we give them old stamps that still have the glue on the back. And it turns out they all look at me and they don't know what to do. Uh, so I have to tell them, no, you have to turn it over and you have to lick the stamp and put it up in the corner, which often reacts to some interesting reactions from the people, such as this gentleman here who seemed to have had a little problem with him. But stamps also became very, very popular, and people not only use them for mailing, but they use them for decorating. This is a fellow who wound up decorating his whole automobile with stamps. We have a nice dress at the museum, which is made entirely out of stamps. Uh, stamps have also been used to raise money for charities. They're called semi-postal uh, stamps. And this was the first one, the raising money. What you do, I think you're aware of this, you pay for the uh, cost of the postage, which is 55 cents right now, and then you tack on another few cents and that goes to the charity. And these are some of the uh, semi-postal stamps that have been issued. Uh, the breast cancer stamp has raised, I think almost a hundred million dollars uh, for breast cancer research and these other uh, stamps as well. And uh, other countries do the same thing. So another use of the post office for charity work. Uh, okay, getting back now, uh, we're getting just close to the uh, civil war. People are uh, have moved out to uh, California where gold was 
discovered in 1848. And of course, they want to get their mail. Uh, it would take a good six weeks to send a letter from Boston to uh, San Francisco because uh, you'd have to put it on a uh, boat, take it down to the Panama Canal, take it off the boat, give it to uh, people with their mules to take across the Isthmus of Panama, put it on another ship, and then get it up to uh, California, especially San Francisco. So there was a hope that the, maybe they could do this a little faster. And so in 1857, they established the Overland Mail Road, which if you can see from that map, went uh, from uh, St. Louis down through the south, through the desert, and then back up to uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco. People aren't as more familiar with that system. They are, of course, familiar with the Pony Express. Pony Express was started in April of 1860. And uh, as you can see from this stamp on the uh, right, it started in uh, St. Joseph, Missouri, traveled about 2,000 miles to uh, Sacramento, California. It would take maybe only 15 days for the Pony Express riders to deliver it. But remember, California, uh, the Civil War was uh, fast approaching, and California wanted to get the news of what was happening. And there was some talk of even California uh, being its own country. And, but the Pony Express did it, but it didn't last that long, even though everybody knows about it. It uh, disappeared after 18 months because of the telegraph. And telegraph wires were strung all the way across the, uh, the western part of our country. And messages kind of, of course, that's a uh, picture of Samuel and Morse there. Then in uh, 19, I'm sorry, 1862, uh, because of the Civil War, uh, they decided that uh, people should get, can get their mail delivered to their house. One of the emotional reasons were people would have to wait in long lines for their mail if they were expecting to hear about their husband or their son or somebody in the family who was in the war. Uh, the post office felt this was a little unfair to people, especially if you got a note that you had lost a dear one. And so they decided to start city mail delivery uh, right in the middle of the uh, Civil War. Speaking of the Civil War, and uh, there's been a question of, uh, in the current news about uh, the soldiers mailing in their ballots. Turns out about 700,000 uh, soldiers were able to uh, vote by mail uh, to their uh, uh, division. And if there wasn't a way to do that, they were actually sent home so they could vote. So voting by mail has a long uh, history in our country. And of course, when the uh, South seceded, uh, they were, we were not obviously gonna deliver uh, mail for them. So they created their own uh, post office. Uh, and they I should mention, uh, we have an interesting rule in this uh, post office, and that is only people who are deceased get to be on a stamp. No living person gets on a stamp until they die and usually have to wait a few years before the post office puts them. The South didn't have that same uh, uh, restriction, and so that's Jefferson Davis on the left. And that's a statue on the right of the uh, postmaster of the South. Then, uh, of course, as mail continued to be uh, uh, in demand, and more and more uh, letters were being sent, uh, they wanted to, it's always been the uh, goal of the post office to get mail sent as fast as possible. And so trains were the way that mail was transferred. And interestingly, first they just carried the mail, and then it was sorted when it dropped off the train. But then in the 1860s, it was actually decided to sort mail on the train. And that became the major uh, way. And if you've seen those old pictures of the mail bags on the side of um, the uh, tracks where they didn't even have to stop the train. They just dropped, picked up a sack and dropped it off. Then postcards became popular. We call them a, the original tweet, short message. Uh, they started in 1863 with what we call the uh, penny postcard. And then by uh, 1907, picture postcards were very, very popular. But it wasn't until 1907 that you could actually write a message, message on the back of the postcard. If you collect postcards or seen old postcards, if there's writing on the, around the picture, that was, postcard was sent before 1907. And then uh, with the world uh, getting smaller and smaller, uh, agreements had to be made about delivering mail to other countries. And so a man named uh, Montgomery Blair, who was the postmaster during the Civil War for Abraham Lincoln, he uh, it, um, discussed having an agreement between countries that we would deliver their mail if they would deliver ours at no extra cost. And so by 1874, the organization called the Universal Postal Union was established for all rules about international mail. Then another thing that influenced the uh, post office was uh, Christmas cards. Man right out there in Worcester, 
uh, Louis Prang, probably uh, one of the most famous people for printing uh, Christmas cards, and he made over five million a year. And obviously, this with the demand on the post office uh, for delivering there. I should say, some of you might remember. Uh, if you've uh, been around long enough, uh, that you used to be able to, when when postage was only three cents, you could also send a post a Christmas card for only a penny and a half. I don't know if any of you remember that, but the reason you could send it for half price was you didn't seal the envelope. Then special delivery came along. You'd pay an extra ten cents. Sometimes the, the mail could be delivered uh, right during the same day. In fact, uh, several cities had uh, delivery several times a day. You could post a letter in the morning and it might get to where you wanted it to go in the same day. Then a very uh, man named uh, Mr. Uh, Wanamaker, you may remember that name from the Philadelphia stores. He was made uh, uh, postmaster general by Benjamin Harrison since he was his campaign manager. And he, uh, as a businessman, uh, wanted to improve all the service for uh, uh, the post office. And uh, one of the things he uh, uh, did was uh, issue the first commemorative stamps. They were all celebrating uh, the arrival of uh, Columbus. It was a year late, but this was the first time stamps actually had pictures on them rather than just people. Uh, and I like to show the uh, $4 stamp because that's Queen Isabella on the stamp. And interestingly, the very first woman to appear on a United States stamp was not an American, it was Isabella. And then of course, the first woman, you may think about it for a second, and that was Martha Washington, who appeared in the first American stamp. And then in 1913, the post office realized that uh, they were losing money uh, because they weren't delivering uh, big packages. And so they started with parcel post. And these are all the different parcel post stamps for the different amount of postage. These stamps didn't last too long. One of the troubles was since they were all red, uh, the uh, Mailmen had a hard time, uh, took them longer to figure out the right postage or the right postage was on there. So these stamps uh, only lasted for a few years. And then, of course, uh, as I mentioned, Mr. Wanamaker, he had the idea that let's deliver mail to everybody's uh, house. And so rural free uh, delivery uh, started. Uh, it was an experimental basis. There were a lot of objections to it. It was going to be costly to uh, put people out on the road rather than have uh, the farmers come to town to get their mail. Uh, but it started, and by 1903, it became official, and all homes and the post office delivers mail everywhere in the United States, even to down to the bottom of the uh, Grand Canyon. Three days a week, the mules head down there with the mail. There's an Indian tribe living down there. And, of course, the post office delivers to places that FedEx and the UPS do not. In fact, they may take the packages on the last few miles to deliver those. Uh, and the reason Parcel Post came about uh, was because of a, a place called uh, Wells Fargo. Uh, with the uh, advent of Parcel Post, a lot of different things could be sent. You may have seen in the news recently, people mail their baby chicks. Uh, the news controversy uh, was that the post office slowed down. The chicks were not surviving. And they can survive for two days, uh, but they were not doing. But so it's a big business, you can get your baby chicks. And on the other end, this is an example of how eggs were sent by parcel post by the uh, farmer's wife. She uh, collected the eggs, took them down to the train station, put them in this uh, aluminum uh, box, sent it out, and then the box was sent back to her empty. And that was, uh, that was just two of the things you could mail by parcel post. Another one was your laundry. Very often uh, college students especially would get one of these laundry packs send it on home to mom, she would make do the laundry, fold it all up, and then uh, send it uh, back. And this is one of the kind of suitcases that carried that mail. And there's a very uh, kind of famous story about a little girl who lived in Idaho. She wanted to go visit her grandmother, and her father didn't have money for the train ticket. He had heard about parcel post, and he went down and he said, can I mail my daughter? And they checked all the regulations, and there wasn't anything against mailing people. So they put some postage stamps on it, supposedly, put her on the mail car, and she got delivered to, uh, to grandma. They since then have changed the, uh, changed the rules. Uh, the post office, like uh, all other organizations, has been involved in uh, uh, segregation and uh, discrimination. And uh, black postmasters, especially in the South, were not uh, very popular. Some of them actually even uh, got lynched. 
And there's a famous story about this postmaster, one of the first, maybe the first African American female uh, postmaster. Uh, her name was Minnie Cox, and she was driven out of her, and she was forced to resign by her community down in Mississippi. Teddy Roosevelt was president at the time, and we heard about it. He closed the post office, and uh, the folks had to go about 30 miles away to uh, get their mail. Uh, and then uh, Woodrow Wilson came in, and you may be aware that he uh, instituted a lot of segregation in the uh, government. And uh, he had the black uh, postal workers working separately from the uh, white postmasters. Even on the trains, they had to have separate parts, even in the post offices. So the uh, African Americans organized their own union uh, to protect themselves. And they were a very pow powerful force. And I had just found this out, but Frederick Douglass, the very famous abolitionist, at his funeral, 10 of the pallbearers were African Americans who belonged to the Postal Workers Union. Then in 1918, uh, airplanes, the Wright brothers only a few years earlier had uh, got the planes going. And so the uh, post office, as I said, always wants to get the mail as fast as possible. So they said, let's do airmail. And so 1918, and of the airmail stamp, this is probably one of the most famous ones. If you've heard about stamps, you know that uh, this is called the inverted Jenny. Uh, there's only 100 of these stamps. They were only made on one sheet. And if, depending on the condition of the stamp, they can sell from anywhere from 300,000 to a million, a million dollars. And actually that was airmail. The uh, pilots were very uh, uh, courageous men. Uh, there were no radar, no radios or anything. They actually used these towers that were placed along the uh, roots of the planes. And they uh, would, the pilots would search for those. And then on the ground, they would see arrows, which would point them in the right uh, direction to fly. So they would use these. They'd also use uh, railroad tracks as their navigation tool. Uh, and one of the most famous uh, pilots, airmail pilots, before he flew off to Paris was Charles Lindbergh. And, uh, and after that, he uh, worked for the post office to help them. I, if you're a cat lover, uh, you might like this uh, little stamp. This was a stamp issued by Spain to celebrate uh, Lindbergh's flight. And there's a little pussycat on the right-hand side. And uh, that's considered maybe the first time a cat has appeared on a stamp. Somebody asked Lindbergh, did you take your cat with you? And he said, no, definitely not. It would have been too dangerous. Then there's a thing called catapult mail, which again was to design to get mail faster from Europe to America. And it would be put on the uh, passenger ships. On the back of the uh, ship, there'd be a catapult. And when they got to about 400 miles from uh, New York City, uh, they would put the mail in the plane, catapult it off, and it would get uh, almost maybe two days earlier. And it was a, a fast way of, uh, of getting mail in. Uh, then again, uh, something about the post office, those little letter boxes. This was a design of what probably one of the first mailboxes looked like uh, back in the 1850s. And, uh, um, and then they kept changing the uh, models. And you can see 1909, the four-legged boxes. 1918, they were all olive green, which I think is kind of interesting. The reason why, they got the paint from the, from the army, leftover paint. Then they, some of you may remember mailboxes looking to be uh, red, white, and blue. And now in 1971, they all became uh, uh, dark blue. These are just some examples of some of the uh, post offices. They've had some fun. Uh, they, for a while, when Star Wars was popular, they actually made mailboxes that looked too like R2-D2. And some of you may remember these. You'll still see them in some of the uh, old office buildings, the mail chutes. Uh, that would save the uh, mailman from having to go up and down to pick up the mail. Uh, there was one couple of famous companies that made these. Uh, they were outlawed in the 70s uh, for fire reasons. It might be an easy way to carry up the fire. But you can still see them in a lot of old uh, uh, older buildings, and some of them are quite uh, fancy uh, design. And these you uh, no longer exist, but these are another example of the boxes on the green screen. And mailboxes, as you may, maybe in your own neighborhood, notice that they are uh, decreasing. Uh, there's a little rule that there have to be at least 25 letters a day, average, mailed in a post box. And if that doesn't happen, then the post office takes them away. So if you want to keep your mailbox, make sure that you uh, use your neighborhood uh, uh, mailbox. But uh, they are a disappearing uh, breed. 
Uh, stamp collecting became popular because the post office pushed it, and especially uh, President uh, Roosevelt. Uh, he was a big uh, stamp collector. And I found this interesting. There was a man named Captain Tim who had a radio show right on WBZ. Uh, actually, it was a national show. It was sponsored by Ivory Soap. And if you sent uh, Captain Tim for a uh, soap label, he'd send you some stamps. In World War II, the biggest problem with mail was the volume, and they just could not carry envelopes uh, on the planes along with ammunition and uh, uh, food. So they uh, came up with the idea we call V-mail, which is uh, a, taking a letter, it would be put in that special uh, type paper on the left, and then they would microfilm it, send the microfilm over, and then reproduce the letter in a smaller shape. And that's how millions, over a million letters got sent during World War II. If it hadn't been that way, uh, it would have been a much uh, uh, longer uh, trip for that. And of course, mail during any war is uh, very important to soldiers. And I did find out uh, there was a uh, little, uh, some uh, shorthand that wives or husbands too would put on. And SWAK would mean sealed with a kiss. And, uh, of course, there was also censorship of the mail from the troops. Uh, they could not reveal where they, uh, where they were. And there's also this stamp on the left called the Win the War stamp uh, was uh, issued during World War II. It was kind of a propaganda piece. The Germans considered it propaganda, and they would not accept mail from the United States that had the Win the War stamp on it. But the Red Cross would uh, uh, deliver mail to uh, concentration camps, especially uh, in Germany. And then, of course, with the shortage of men, women started uh, carrying the mail, and uh, it continued right up until today. And uh, some of you may remember this story of called Miracle on 34th Street. A very famous movie takes place with the Macy's Day Parade. And uh, it's, it's, uh, the theme of it is somebody who's claiming that he really is Kris Krinkle, uh, Santa Claus, and the way his lawyer proves to the judge that he is Santa Claus he had all the letters that children have sent to Santa Claus that was sitting in the New York City Post Office. They were all delivered to the courtroom to show that the Post Office, which is an official branch of the government, uh, recognizes this man as Santa Claus. So I'm sure most of you have uh, seen that movie. It shows every, every year at Thanksgiving. And then they tried some experimental things. Uh, they, uh, during President Eisenhower's, they thought maybe we could deliver mail by rockets. Uh, it was not successful and did not last uh, very long. Then, of course, the, the uh, volume of mail was continually getting larger and larger, and they needed to get into automation. So the first automated uh, post office was opened down in uh, Rhode Island uh, to speed up the mails. And then in 1963, zip codes came along, again, because more and more mail. And maybe you didn't know, but zip code means zone improvement plan. And I uh, found out that even Ethel Merman was using one of these commercials. But uh, usually, if you remember, before the, uh, in bigger cities, they had um, zones. And I think Arlington may have had several uh, zones. And the zone now is part of the, uh, part of the zip code. And then in 1969, 1970, the post office was really in a mess. This is a cover of a 1969 uh, Life magazine. And uh, they would did the same thing that people are doing today. They were sending a letter to see how long it would take to get from different uh, cities. And this uh, caused the uh, post office uh, some big turmoil. In fact, the postal workers actually went on strike in 1970. Uh, they brought the army in, in the cities anyway, to deliver the mail. Strike didn't last too long, and there were agreements. Basically, the strike was over the poor pay that uh, postal workers were getting. So in 1971, uh, President Nixon uh, reorganized the uh, post office. He took it out of being a cabinet position, made it semi-independent. People, there is no government money uh, that is used to uh, pay for the uh, post office. Uh, and uh, this served as a helpful way. It also did away with some of the uh, patronage that was still going on. But uh, then in 19, in 2006, there was more legislation, which is what has caused the problem now for uh, the post office, and that is the post office is expected to pay the pension in advance, which very other, few other companies have to do. And that's actually what's put it in the, uh, in the uh, red 
uh, today. And hopefully, as I said in the beginning, Congress may approve some uh, money as a loan, uh, but that's still uh, on hold. So that's uh, a quick uh, trip through the uh, history of the uh, post office. It's part of our uh, history. Uh, and it, uh, without the post office, who knows how our country would have developed. So let me stop here. Uh, just say that if you have questions about uh, our museum, we do have a website. We just put up a, a virtual trip. So you can walk around the, uh, the gallery. Uh, we also have our email. Be happy to take any email questions from you from uh, my presentation. And uh, if you have an old, uh, if you have an old collection sitting in the uh, uh, closet, you know, up in the attic, you can get it out and we do evaluations, even though we're closed for we'll visit. So we, if you give us a call or an email, we can set up an evaluation. And if it turns out your stamps are not very valuable, which turns out in the cases very often uh, happens, then we're happy to take donations that we use with our education programs and, uh, uh, and also to help with the fundraise. So I think uh, it's a quick trip through the uh, history. I uh, noticed there's a few things I can probably add. And uh, But anyway, I hope that's been uh, good information for you. And I always like to hear anybody who has good stories about their experience with the post office. So Anna, I think we're all set for that. Yeah, um, we are going to, I'm going to ask you to turn off the presentation now, Henry, and we are going to do a brief Q&A. So if people do have any questions now, please do feel free okay. to enter them in the question and answer panel. You can just stop sharing. Here, thank you. Okay. Um, you can enter those questions in the Q&A panel and we're going to take them. I'm going to share them and please feel free to put any questions again that you might have. I wanted to begin with a comment that Richard Duffy, who's a town historian who presented on um, the history of the Ar of Arlington's libraries just last week wanted to answer your question and then we'll get to questions from the audience. Oh, about that building? Yeah, so Richard has written into the Q&A. It's a uh, reply to your question about whether or not the post office building shown in the antique postcard is still standing. Yes, it is, although greatly altered in the 1950s. For many years, it was the Arlington National Bank and then the Coolidge Bank. The address is 635 Mass Ave, and the building is adjacent to the Uncle Sam Plaza on Mystic Street. Um, and I did learn quite a bit from Richard last week about where libraries have been over the years, and that building has not served as the library for quite a few years. Um, the library's current location opened in um, 1896, I believe. Richard will tell me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah. <laughs> So that was fantastic. I learned so much and I just had a few questions as people might be entering some additional questions in the Q&A panel. Okay. I was really, really surprised to hear that zip codes were not introduced until 1963. Right, okay, go ahead. Yeah, it was just like that to me, you know, obviously I've, I don't remember a time before zip codes. What, what? Well, let me, let me uh, improvement plan. The reason for zip codes was just, uh, you know, more and more mail being done, and it was a way of uh, just getting the mail faster. And now almost all countries have some form of a zip code. But if you remember the old uh, Elvis Presley song, Return to Sender, yeah. you, you know that there's a little line in there. It says, Return to Sender, address unknown, no such number, no such zone. And that song was then obviously... Uh, written before 1963 when he mentioned zone rather than uh, zip code. We have another question, um, and this one you may or may not be able to answer. The question is why is the post office politicized and why have some business people wanted to privatize the post office? And it sounds like it is a sort of a semi-private and it has been semi-private for quite a while. Right. And uh, the questioner goes on to ask what happened to the postal service in the UK and was that semi-privatized? A lot, a lot of the post offices are. I, I, I was lucky enough to visit uh, New Zealand a few years ago, and they actually had two types of mailboxes on the street for the uh, government one and the uh, uh, private uh, service. Uh, people think it, it just would it would be a it's a business choice to you know United Parcel and FedEx. The argument against it is that it does not make money for them. If there was no post office, they would not be delivering mail to every house. Uh, so, uh, and, and again, it's in the Constitution, uh, but it, it's more of, can you, can you make more money delivering uh, mail and packages than the post office does? But 
I don't think that's ever really going to happen. Yeah, thank you. I was also, another piece that really surprised me was the push to deliver mail to rural communities in 1896. And I think I was under the impression that that happened far earlier. Can you tell well, no, us? I'm sorry, there was, people got mail, they just didn't get it delivered they, to their house. Right, they had to go pick it up at different places. Right. Um, and that seems like it must have been a huge undertaking, including a huge financial undertaking for the post office. Can you tell a little bit about the work that went into rural mail delivery? You no, know, no, it was that uh, Mr. Wanamaker, the uh, businessman who became postmaster general, it was his idea. He had, he had to fight for it for uh, almost seven or eight years because of the cost. You needed a lot more people to, uh, to go out and deliver the mail. Um, and that was basically the the argument against it, but uh, people felt in the uh, in the countryside that they deserved as good a service as people in the cities, and so. Uh, but the mail those mailmen actually could they could sell stamps, they could uh, cancel stamps. Uh, there are stories where they were asked to go pick up the groceries as long as they were going by. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, it just became an issue I think of fairness to everybody to get their mail. I also was curious. Um, you mentioned that 700,000 Union soldiers voted, mailed it, voted by mail-in ballot during the Civil War? Yeah, uh, that may be a little exaggeration number, but there definitely was, they definitely, uh, because most of them felt the, that they were gonna vote for Lincoln uh, as their commander in chief. Uh, that's why the army uh, made an extra efforts to, uh, to let them vote. Uh-huh. Wow, it's fantastic. Really interesting. I was, the John Wanamaker stories really interested me. Obviously, he undertook a huge effort, um, and he, you know, he made a lot of effort to improve mail service for all kinds of people, but he was not somebody with post office experience in his background. Right, and that's, that's been an issue. That's the issue with the current uh, postmaster general, who uh, famously, when they asked him what it cost to mail a postcard, didn't know. Uh, but the, um, it, it's not always the case that they work their way up. But for example, John Farley, I don't believe he uh, worked in the post office either. Uh, so there's a history of both people with post office experience yeah. and post office people without. Yeah, you know, that's a good question. And I'd have to, uh, we've had quite a few uh, postmasters, some of them only lasting a year, because again, it would be uh, whoever was president. Uh, very, it was not, if, when a new uh, president came in, they would change the postmaster. Mm -hmm. Unusual to it. In fact, so it's always been a politically appointed position. Yeah, in fact, uh, post, uh, the, you mentioned the Arlington Post Office. There are some places where people would just have the post office in their, in their home. And when the uh, president, different, uh, president of a different party got elected, the uh, Republican or the Democrat would become uh, postmaster and they'd move it to his house. Uh, so, uh, it, yeah, it definitely was. In fact, if you've seen the movie Lincoln, when Lincoln is trying to get votes to pass the 13th Amendment, he sends out his people to, tell, to talk to congressmen and promise them a uh, postmaster job when they left Congress. So it definitely has a uh, patronage type uh, atmosphere to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a question from an um, attendee. Is it true that Congress gets to send letters for free? If it's a uh, congressional business, uh, just the same as the, uh, the president. If it's for official business, it's called the franking privilege. Uh, but there was a uh, congressman who got in trouble for sending out his Christmas cards, I think, or using it for campaign purposes. Uh, so the other people who get free mail are uh, soldiers in uh, combat areas. Uh, they, they also can send letters for free. But nobody can send letters to them for free. Uh, no, and that's, that's a good question. No, they, they can't. Uh, in fact, even some of the soldiers can. If you send a care package to a soldier, sometimes they suggest you put the stamps in there. Another question from a, uh, a, a attendee. I just learned there are postal investigators and police. What do they do? Oh, yeah, that, I, I didn't include that because that's a whole other uh, aspect of the postal. The, the postal police, in fact, uh, uh, when there was the uh, marathon bombing, uh, because I think they did blow up a, uh, a mailbox, the police were called in. Uh, there's a lot of fraud, mail fraud they have to investigate, 
uh, people counterfeit stamps, uh, so they have to investigate that. Uh, in the old days, one of the big things was robbing uh, trains. In fact, if you uh, remember the old movie Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and they're, they're running away because they used to rob the mail trains, and then the uh, postal police were sent after them. So they, they, had, they have quite a, uh, in fact, uh, my understanding is they will be sent out during on election day to various uh, post offices to uh, see how the mail is going. Wow, well, thank you so much. This was really interesting. I learned a lot. I'm not sure if there's any last questions. As I'm waiting for people to enter last questions in case they have any, I do want to mention the piece that I was sort of expecting you to talk about, but you did not talk about Ponzi and the fact that the original Ponzi, his scheme oh, was Oh, yes. Stamps. That's a little hard to explain, but yeah, you're <laughs> right. Ponzi was able to get some stamps. He could buy them cheaper in Europe, I believe, than here, and then he was able to sell them here at a higher price, and that's how he uh, started getting his money. Yep. I um, did not know that at all until I read the book Ponzi Scheme. He was also, he was living in like Lexington or Wellesley or someplace quite near where we are now. Yeah, when, he, he was actually uh, in the uh, North End, I believe, in, in I think he was, Yeah, born there, and then I think as he, as his scheme blossomed, he did move out to either Lexington or Wellesley, someplace like that, but quite close to where we are now was really interesting. I'd hide, if people are interested in the stamp piece, that part was, I had just had no idea that a Ponzi scheme was actually about selling stamps. Well, I think it's still true that you can buy a, a, an international stamp here in the United States, send it to a friend in Europe, and they can use it to mail a letter back. I haven't seen that recently, but that was, you know, if you were trying to, had a friend over in Europe who didn't have much money, you, know, you would send them the stamps to use that you could buy here. So, um, but the Ponzi scheme definitely, had a connection with uh, the post uh, with stamps. Yeah. Question, another question from a member, how, excuse me, an attendee, how many miles a day does the average postal worker walk? Great question. My postal worker seems to walk so far, she looks tired a lot. Well, you know, uh, there depends on where you are because in New York City, some uh, uh, mail, uh, post letter carriers only do one or two apartment buildings, which takes them most of the day to sort the mail. Remember the uh, the old the, uh, the the towers, the twin towers had five different zip codes. That's how much mail was going into those buildings. So it's hard to say uh, who you know an average walk, but it depends on uh, what your route is. Uh, bicycles. Some some people are advocating using uh, bikes. Uh, anyway, yeah, it's that's a good question, and I don't know what the average walking of a postman would be. There is a lot. Yep. Yep. Um, I think that's all the questions we have for today. I want to thank you so much for joining us. I know I learned a lot about it. <laughs> really, some of this information was just so amazing to me. And this is an organization that we all touch. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come talk to us. I want to, again, thank the Arlington Libraries Foundation for sponsoring tonight's program. I also wanted to let everyone who's here know that um, Henry was generous enough to provide us with uh, museum passes for, for our museum pass program for the Stalmini Museum. I know that they are closed now, but I hope we come to a time when we will uh, we'll be able to offer those passes to the community. I think it's uh, really fantastic no. that we are so close to this museum and that you're giving us the opportunity to learn more. Yeah, and if people have a, have a chance, check our website. We just did a 12-minute uh, virtual quick tour of the museum, which gives you a little better idea of all the things we offer. Great. Well, thank you so much. Again, I really appreciate you taking the time. I want to thank everybody in the audience for coming to hear us tonight. Um, just want for you, one last comment. Somebody again said, thank you. Very interesting. And I second that comment. Thank you all so much. Please continue to look uh, for our programming events. A lot of new, great new programs that keep coming up at the Robbins Library, even through this difficult time. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful night and stay safe.